Can I get the other panelists? Where's Marcus? Is Marcus around? Oh yeah, Marcus, if you could come up and join. So we're, we're going we're gonna to start the panel. These guys are just setting up. We're going to do a few slides. Um, well, at least Julian and, and Jason are going to do a few slides to kind of get the panel started. And like I said before, if you could hold your questions while they're presenting the slides. I know you'll have lots of questions because we want to save the questions till after the slides so that we can address it to the, the panelists. Who else are we missing? We've got Marcus. Bert's coming up, yes. Two, three, four, five. Yeah, perfect, okay. So this panel is going to be about licensing, open source licensing in fact actually, yes, a good correction. Um, thank our panelists that are up here, I'll just briefly let you know on who they are. So uh, on the right, representing Squeak, we've got Bert, next to him, so we've got the open source guys on the, uh, the kind of the Squeak distribution guys on the, on the right here, so we have Marcus representing Faro. In the middle, we've, uh, we've got an actual, uh, I, uh, what would you say, lawyer? I IP lawyer. So we've got Henrietta here. So, and she's going to help us kind of keep everything under control and make sure we don't uh, say anything that we're not supposed to. <coughs> and then representing Seaside, we've got Julian. And then we have Jason representing um, sort of the corporate syncom side as well. So... Without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to, to Jason and Julian to kind of give us some slides so that we can kind of ground the conversation. So if I just pass that over. Okay, so we've got about 25 slides and we're going to try and do it in 20 minutes. So we're going to be very fast. But if you can't understand what we're saying, stop us. Um, otherwise, questions till the end. Right, so our objective here was really to encourage the small talk community to uh, build better uh, open source software projects, and uh, an important part of that is getting the licensing issues right. Uh, it is a lot less painful if you get those issues right up front, um, and don't let them come and bite you. Um, Julian and I would just like to make it absolutely clear, we are not legal experts, and uh, we may well have uh, failed to understand some of the subtleties of what we're saying, but we're just trying to start the, uh, give some frame of reference for the conversation with the panel. Okay, so uh, why do we care? Next slide. Oh, I have one. <laughs> <laughs> Told you we'd so, it up. Uh, why does this whole thing matter? Often when we talk about this, people say, we'll deal with it when we come up, uh, when it comes up. But the problem is that by the time it comes up, if you've been infringing, you've been infringing from the point that you started using it. It doesn't just start when it's discovered that you're infringing. Um, and if you're distributing software, that is found to be infringing, your users are infringing. So it's not just you, right? Your people may be going after your users when they come after this. You can't just go back and erase all of that history. Um, and these issues are easier to resolve upfront when what you're distributing doesn't have much value, right? There's not, someone's not coming after you for some little thing that you've written with no value. Um, once you've gone years down the road and you want to sell it, well then, you know, someone's going to care. So these things are simpler to sort out upfront. Um, at this point, you also have choices. You can move on to something else. If it turns out you have a problem with some piece of software, you can easily move to something else. Um, and a good example, or a possible example, of someone sitting and coming in later is the Oracle Google thing. Um, it seems likely that Sun had these patents and Sun wasn't that interested in doing anything with them, but in part of the purchase agreement, um, you know, one of the things, one of the values that Sun had was that they had these patents that could be used against Google. So you may have someone, an individual, who or a company that you think is, you know, they're good nature, they're not going to use it, but what if someone else buys them down the road? Um, and the penalties here can be financial, they can be professional, um, and they can even be criminal. Um, 
penalties for this. Um, also, it's all about copyright. So copyright is fundamental to open source. Um, the GPL only works because of copyright. The copyright is what allows you to exercise um, the, the right to restrict people's usage. Um, so if you don't understand the copyright, if you don't own the thing that you're licensing, you don't have any ability to say, well, you can only use it if, because that comes from the fact that you own it. Um, so this is all about understanding copyright so that you can make it your friend and use it for your benefit. Copyright in and of itself is not evil. Okay, so let's talk about some of the uh, legal concepts that we've got to cover. First, intellectual property. We're going to mention the two forms of intellectual property that protect software. The first one is copyright. Copyright, okay, copyright is about a creative work that has some level of originality in it. Uh, there is, uh, it's tangible, okay, it's not an abstract idea. It has a, uh, what you might term a chain of creativity. You create something and then it gets modified and changed or you create derivative works from it. And uh, really there are two aspects to copyright. The first is the moral uh, rights, which are generally, in most jurisdictions, not transferable. The moral right to be assigned to be an author and a few other uh, minor things generally. Um, and the more significant one is the economic rights to actually exploit commercially uh, that copyright. And uh, it's important to note now that you generally don't need to put a copyright statement on something to retain the copyright, okay? So if you see uh, something on a website that has no copyright statement, that doesn't mean that you can just go and lift it, okay? Uh, in most jurisdictions today, uh, that copyright is uh, retained by the copyright owner, regardless of that, uh, you know, that C thing, okay? That's, that C and uh, funny squiggly thing and, and all rights reserved is just for information purposes to help you identify who really owns the rights. But uh, it doesn't mean that that's lacking and you, you can go and do whatever you like with it. Uh, be very aware that it is very um, country specific. Uh, there are international treaties, European-wide and worldwide, that have helped standardize it to some degree, but it is still country-specific. Still me. Oh. Okay, uh, the second one is patents. Um, okay, so uh, this is quite exciting, of course, because uh, we have the Android situation where uh, Oracle is suing uh, Google, and the main line of attack here is uh, patents, uh, it's pretty clear that for the last 10 years, they, uh, a large number of vendors have been building up large patent arsenals. You can think of it a, of a stage of Cold War, okay? Everyone has been arming like crazy, and um, in the last couple of years, um, that has been heating up, and uh, we expect it to get um, uh, more into open warfare over patents. So it'll be very interesting to see uh, what happens from a legal perspective, and I think that the Oracle um, Google thing is just the opening salvo of what could be quite a, uh, a bloody set of legal exchanges. Uh, okay, then I want to just talk quickly about GPL3, which has um, some protections in it for patent rights, but you need to be aware that that does not protect you from third-party patent claims. So uh, GPL3, um, if if something is licensed on it, under it, and it infringes a third-party patent, then you're still in trouble, okay? So you've still got to, you've still got to really worry about um, patents from that point of view from the open source community side. Okay, so uh, the concept of copyright ownership. Um, to have copyright ownership means that you have the, the right to do and to authorize other people to do several things, and those include copying it, um, creating derivative works from it, which we sort of talked about and we'll talk about again, and the ability to distribute it. So it's both that you have the right to do it and that you have the ability to say whether other people can or cannot do these individual rights. Uh, and each of these rights can be transferred to other people. You can either assign your right to someone else, which is kind of a permanent, uh, a permanent thing, and you can assign them individually. So I could assign you the right to distribute it, but I still have the right to create der derivative works, for example. Um, so an assignment is, is a permanent assignment, and uh, you can also grant a license. And a license, um, actually we talk more about license, so I won't go into that at the moment. 
Um, one of the most tricky things you need to be aware with with copyright ownership is that if you're an employee in an employee-employer relationship in many jurisdictions, it's highly likely that your employer owns anything that you do, so, I mean, certainly at work, but in many cases also in your spare time. Um, so that depends a lot on where you are, what the work is, and so on. Places like California, for example, has very strong protection for the employee. Um, so in California, it's quite likely that you own it. But in other places, if what you're doing is even remotely related to your work, and depending on the wording of your contract, you may find that you actually don't own things that you are doing in your spare time. Um, so this is, this is kind of a big concern that I think a lot of people aren't aware of, and you kind of need to be aware of that. Um, moving from the concept of having a single owner of a piece of work into a larger project with multiple contributors, obviously this adds complexity. Um, how many people do you need to get to agree if you want to do an assignment or a licensing? Because each of those owners can only transfer the bit that they own. Um, so there's a broad spectrum of project organizations from a very simple structure to a very complex. Uh, and you may be able to set that up so that you're transferring all of your rights into one legal entity, for example, so that the individual programmers no longer own the rights and there's actually one single entity that can make that decision. Um, another dimension to look at is, is whether it's a clear, whether the ownership's clear or unclear. Um, and that's less about how many people there are, but how confident you are that the people you think are the owners are the owners. Um, it's all very well to know, well, there's 10 contributors, and I know who they are, and if we want to relicense, we can get them to sign it. But, you know, if you're not, if it turns out that actually their employers owned it and they didn't have the right to give it to you in the first place, then you've got a problem. So what degree of, what degree of clarity do you have about that? Okay, so uh, IP licensing is the authorization by an owner to give some rights of usage generally to uh, other th third parties. Um, they normally have some kind of restrictions in terms of either usage or the time which you can use them. And, uh, you know, it's very important to recognize that no one has a moral right to use anything. Uh, you know, if someone has the copyright to something, you've got no rights to use that unless you come to some kind of uh, license agreement with the rights holder. Um, you can agree anything pretty well within some limitations in a uh, directly negotiated agreement between two parties over a licensing terms. And uh, it may be the case that when you come across uh, you know, a FOSS license, you may not like it, but those terms are agreed. There's another oddity with FOSS licensing that um, Basically, even though someone else may be distributing it, okay, um, the license, the FOSS license, exists between the original author okay, and the user of the software, and not between the intervening distributor. Um, however, there are obligations that that distributor uh, may well assume to do with warranties, which we'll talk about in a minute. That was a quick one. Um, derivative works um, is a complex concept, um, particularly when it comes to software. Um, a derivative work is something that continues what we referred to before as the chain of creativity. So it's something that is based on some other copyrighted work. Um, and this could be a modification to it, it could be an extension to it, it could be a combination of two other copyrighted works into a new work. Um, forks would certainly be considered derivative works. Um, and you know, even things like adaptations and translations. So a translation of a book, which clearly has no word the same as the original, is still a derivative work. And an adaptation, which maybe takes a, a book and turns it into a screenplay. Again, there's, you know, it may not be a very direct transfer, but it's based on that prior work. So that is enough to make it derivative. Um, and in such a case, for it with a translation, for example, if you wanted to publish a translation, you need uh, permission both from the author of the translation and from the author of the original. So those, um, those rights sort of carry down through the chain. Um, the problem is that the definition of a derivative work is pretty broad and it's actually pretty unclear. And there's a lot of people break down into arguments over, well, is that derivative? That's, that can't be derivative. You know, and, and the problem is that you're, um, the, the, if someone can prove that, you're, that your code is derivative um, and that you weren't entitled to use it, this can have a very significant impact. Um, and maybe you weren't entitled to use it because it was viral and it, it had an effect on, you know, you didn't follow the, the restrictions of the viral license. 
maybe it turns out it was commercial software and you hadn't paid the licensing fee for it. Um, maybe it turns out that it was owned by somebody's employer and so although they granted you a license, they didn't have the authority to grant it. Um, and all of those things can be, uh, have a huge impact on you and again also on your users. So as a socially responsible open source developer, I think you, know, you don't want to be passing that kind of stuff on. So really the best thing to do up front is to simply try to avoid the issue of derivative, well of problematic derivative works. In general, everything you do is going to be derivative from something but you need to take that effort to be as certain as possible that the things that you are uh, importing, subclassing, uh, even just sort of looking at and copying the ideas from, you need to understand, at least as best as you can, wha who owns that, what are the rights you have to that. Um, and the other thing to note is just that doing a safe, clean room implementation of something is very, very, very difficult. And again, this you know, we keep touching on Google and Android, and it's convenient that this came up just as we were doing this talk. But it's another great example where Google has attempted to do a clean room implementation, um, but you know, in their case, it's partly patents, not copyright. But they've also hired um, they've hired programmers from uh, from the Sun team to implement that. So you know, some you can attempt, but you have to be very careful about it. And it's not as easy as you might think to do something that would be considered clean. Okay, so ownership is. Uh what gives you the control to do what you want with the software, and uh, it gives you exclusive economic rights. You can uh, assign it, you can license it. And without that control, your ability to do what you want with your open source project is limited. Um, why should you care about that? Well, the simple truth is that uh, open source is evolving, open source licensing is evolving. And so we started out with uh, the GPL, then we went to GPL2, we're now at GPL3, um, there's a preference move to Apache, then people decided that Apache wasn't quite liberal enough and they like MIT now. And we can be pretty sure that the uh, licensing models of the open source community will continue to evolve. And so if you want to keep your uh, project acceptable and uh, popular in terms of usage, then uh, you're very likely to want to or need to evolve your licensing model for your open source project. And so owning it or controlling that ownership is important. Okay, so to, to do that, you need to know who your contributors are because if your contributors still own the IP and they haven't granted it to some other body like a trust or a um, stichting or something, then uh, you need to know who they are, you need to be able to get hold of them because you may require them to do a relicensing um, of their contributions. Um, you also need to check that their employer's contracts um, are uh, suitable uh, <laughs> to allow them to do the grants that they're offering to do for the work that they do. Okay, And this is something that frequently isn't addressed uh, when it comes to doing relicensing activities, so that can be an issue as well. Um, and uh, freelance contracts are also something you should check. Uh, very often freelancers you know, believe that they own what they create, but um, the contracts that they sign with employers can sometimes uh, assign everything they create while they're under that contract to that employer. So that also needs to be something that freelancers need to consider. Um, okay, so uh, IP is an asset. Uh, it has a value, and uh, you may want to assign that ownership um, either to uh, some kind of trust or uh, shticting or something like that uh, to give it a longer-term protection to deal with some of the warranty issues, etc. Or you may wish to sell it um, and realize its economic value. Um, and you may also want to license it under a commercial model. And again, Oracle has proved a very nice example of this where most of the uh, Sun Java open source projects that they had and also Solaris have been pulled from open source back into um, closed source and uh, commercial licensing terms. And it's very interesting to see that a lot of those projects simply didn't have communities that could maintain them uh, without the ongoing support of Oracle, and so they effectively have just rolled back into uh, commercial licensed software because there isn't enough of a community to keep a open source version going. Um, so, you know, ownership gives you considerable control and uh, considerable power to do what you need or what you want to do. Um, so, 
there's a number of risks here, both as a user and a developer of open source software. And you obviously need to weigh up for yourself, you know, to what degree you think these risks apply to you and to your users and so on. Um, just want to touch on a couple of the things here that you might want to think about um, when deciding whether it's safe to use a piece of software um, as a user. Uh, one, obviously, as we just touched on there, is the idea of ongoing availability. So uh, a future IP infringement claim um, could threaten your ability to use the product. There might be suddenly, some, someone might come up and say, well, you know, actually this comes from our commercial software and you owe us license fees for that. And you may not be able to own those fees or to afford those fees. Um, and so you may not be able, you may find yourself unable to continue using the software. Um, it could also threaten the community itself. And if the community can't survive, then again, that product is not going to continue to be available for you. Um, the strongest form of protection here for a user is a vendor warranty, which we'll talk about more, a commercial vendor warranty. Um, and we'll talk about that more in a, um, in a moment. <coughs> After that, the next best way to protect yourself from this is, to, is mitigation, which is to have an escape route. So you know that you know, if there's a problem, you have an alternative um, to an alternative piece of software or some way to, um, to, to move on and get out of that situation. Uh, and then finally, beyond that, really all you can do is due diligence. And that's you know, taking the time to understand the intellectual property issues in the software that you are using, um, checking as best you can you know, who owns it and do they seem like they're taking care to keep track of that and so on. Um, there's also, just as a quick note, there is software available. Um, one example is called Black Duck, which will scan, um, you know, generally you're scanning commercial software looking for um, open source software that's being used in it. And so this, would, this is often used when companies are buying, one company is buying another company, they're taking on all of their software and they want to see, you know, is the software that they're taking ownership of, is it clean, is it safe um, for them as a company to take on the, the um, liability for that. Um, another one is ongoing maintenance, um, and uh, that's kind of the community. So we sort of, we did talk about that a bit. Um, y you're doing open source in order to um, share this maintenance burden. Um, and so the question is, if, if the product is pulled back in and suddenly it's not available under uh, anymore under the license, but you have a version already under a license that you can keep using, are you individually or with people that you know in your community able to carry on maintaining that yourself? Okay, understanding your risk as a developer. Um, there are several things that you need to consider. The first one is that uh, it is possible to suffer uh, viral infection from uh, various licenses and uh, that can pollute your own IP. Um, if someone has uh, mistakenly included something that has a viral license in what you then continue to use, your own IP um, might be infected. So for example, um, I believe that Oracle is very firm that you none of its products include um, open source software because they don't want that risk. Um, then uh, you might also end up with uh, derivative work that uh, from IP that uh, you don't own, uh, so that might be commercial software or uh, software from people who didn't have the right to grant it to you. And uh, it, once you get polluted, it is very hard to clean up. You you um, you have to remember that you know, a derivative work isn't just a modification, it may have wider ramifications in terms of how it affects um, your code base. And so, uh, you know, getting rid of pollution is hard and it's hard work. Um, you know, yeah, okay, next one. Um, okay, so, most um, commercial software vendors provide what is known as an IPR indemnity, which is basically a promise that they do have the right to license this software to you, uh, either because they own it or they have a license right from someone who does own it. And uh, that is provided with an unlimited liability and it gives the user of that software a, a reassurance that they are not going to be sued for um, IP infringement for using that software. And uh, most FOSS licenses don't include such an indemnity. So. If uh, you get a infringing, something infringes either copyright or patents, uh, then uh, not only is the original provider of that liable, but all the users. And this is what is a, uh, the situation with the Android um, case, because uh, not only is Google being su sued, 
but it's pretty clear that the uh, developers, the Android developers, are also potentially in line for um, a visit from Oracle's legal team, which uh, you know is not a particularly pleasant experience, I should guess. So, um, you know, one of the interesting things with what you might call hardcore commercial FOSS vendors, okay, the likes of Red Hat and so on, is that their commercial customers are requiring them to provide this kind of IPR indemnity to, to the customers. And so, uh, you know, if you get into uh, large scale open source um, provisions and you start selling uh, support, let us say, for that to customers, then uh, it is quite possible that commercial companies will ask you for some similar kind of indemnity. Um, ah, this is an interesting one. Most uh, European just jurisdictions uh, require the developer of software to provide a minimum warranty period. Normally this is 12 months, in some places it's li you can limit it to 6 months. And uh, so it's 12 months in Germany for example. So uh, 2 years in Germany. Well I think we can restrict it. I'll refer to my... Sorry? Okay, it can be limited to 12. Um, but uh, typically, the uh, FOSS warranty exclusions that you get in a, uh, you know, a typical open source license um, either cannot be uh, enforced or are not fully enforceable within um, those kind of jurisdictions. And this means that uh, the developer of the software or maybe the third, uh, maybe an additional provider of the uh, the package software um, has a liability, a warranty liability to anybody that uses it, um, which you know isn't necessarily what was expected, intended, or desired. Um, and I think it's important to realise that um, a lot of this stuff. Uh, the only way you really know where you stand is when you're standing in front of the judge and the judge is making a decision. So, um, you know, and preferably you don't want to be in that situation. So it's much better to take a preventative approach to the problem. Okay, so that's, that's the slide deck. And uh, we just want to hand it open to the thing, to me. So we didn't quite do it in 20 minutes, but 25. I'm conscious this is all sounding so very serious with the black and white slides, so we can have a little bit of fun with this as, as well, so, you know, before everyone kind of puts their heads in their hands. Um, so we would, obviously people are starting to ask questions, so yes, please address questions to the panel, and like I said, we have Henrietta here as well who can also offer her legal input, so if you can kind of think about how your questions might need that as well, so if we can run out, we have our first customer. I have more of a comment than a question, having been through a lot of these uh, issues recently, and it's a request to the open source community that if they license their license with MIT, they should read the license before they do it, because the license says that you have to maintain the copyright notice associated with the product. And if you don't put a copyright notice, it's not possible for somebody using your MIT software to comply. So make sure that when you actually, you know, when you open source some software and you do a license that you make it possible for other people to comply with the license. I had to pull software from our product for that. I've also had people who say, I'm not going to do a license and if you want your software to ever be incorporated anywhere else and there's no license, the legal people at that company are going to say, you can't use this because we have no idea what's going on here. So uh, I had a person in Denmark who said, uh, okay, I'll provide a license, and the license he said said, you agree that this software has no license, and that was the only <laughs> license he would do. So use a recognized open source license if you want to open source it. Think about it carefully. Make sure that people can actually use it. Should we ask our panelists if, if they do include the licenses in their uh, We do. Uh, as much as I don't know, we do too. Um, yes, we do. I ho hope we do. <laughs> okay. Is that good enough, Henrietta? Uh, like, one, I mean, rather than helping, 
not you doing it, but um, it's uh, in any event very important to in fact read the licenses and, and actually that's more or less what it's all about, that you do read the licenses, that you do know what rights you have to the stuff that you are planning to open source and that you comply with that. And um, um, ultimately most of these licenses, licensing issues can be handled provided that you know them and that you are aware and that you um, also before knowing the licenses are aware that there can be licenses that could actually prevent you from, from doing certain things and distributing things in, a, in, a, in, in, in certain manners and um, it's mostly about awareness and um, then um, reading the, the license and typically the licenses say you pretty transparently what you have to do and for example as um, 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 the gentleman mentioned the MIT license um, explicitly states you which or, or, or uh, which parts and how you how you have to um, um, have to reproduce the parts and um, so does the open SSL license for example there are many very liberal licenses out there which do allow you a lot of things provided that you comply with what you read in them and that's um, manageable and then there are obvi obviously others that do prevent you from doing cer certain things and um, that you must take seriously. Yeah, uh, there was an excellent comment on mm. uh, uh, commentary on to I have a counter question. As vendor, what license do you prefer? MIT is quite uh, permissive, but you say it has some problems. BSD, is, is it better? Or? I have to get an answer for that from the VMware people. I mean, I know MIT is certainly okay as long as people actually provide their name and the copyright, you know, is required. Uh, I think BSD is fine, uh, some of the Apache, you know, later versions. And be aware, too, that a lot of these licenses have, uh, have versions, and some of the earlier versions and the later, you know, so, uh, you know, Apache 1.x license may not be so good, and Apache 2. Dot, you know, may be fine. And I will, yeah, I, I will definitely tell you that you will go through the ringer if your company ever gets bought. Somebody will look through all your software, get the name of everybody who has a copyright. You know, you mentioned Black Duck. There are companies like Palomita. They will go through and, and give you the name of every copyright holder in every line of source code that you have and make you get rid of it if they don't like it. So. Mm. Oh. Yes, I have two... I have two questions. Um, one is related between the difference of the French law of copyright, which is different from the American one. So do you have an idea of the difference? And the second question, this is, for example, for Faro, people sign a license agreement. And some people told me that in US, for example, even if you work at home, you work for your company, so this means that you can even sign a license but this means that in any case what you are doing, this is owned by your company. And that's why I asked Julian, okay, so what is the status for Seaside? So if you now work for Simcom, do your code is still MIT? So in that case, how this is possible that that would work like that? While people told me that this is the inverse. Do you see the same? Uh, I'll jump in just quickly because my answer will probably be shorter. I have, I had to negotiate in my contract to make sure that. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and the second one, or the, actually the first one, which was about um, uh, differences between French and uh, US law. First of all, I need to state I'm a German lawyer, so my um, uh, knowledge about comparative issues between French and US law <laughs> uh, is uh, somewhat limited. But generally, in terms of concept, the, um, I mean, the fact that you require a license, that license is um, that uh, software is protected by copyright, that um, uh, licenses can be restricted in different manners that you need a license to do exactly what you're doing which can for example um, um, be differentiated between um, using modifying distributing and all those acts that um, by themselves constitute acts that are relevant under copyright law um, uh, all those all those um, issues are parallel then um, certainly on um, definitions such as the, de the de definition of a um, deri derivative work, which is very important. Um, um, this 
um, pretty much depends on the local copyright laws. And I know that, for example, the US concept of derivative, derivative works um, is different um, than the one under German law and would, would assume it is, again, different from, from the French one. And that was, in fact, the reason why, in, um, um, why the GPL um, does not by itself um, contain a, um, a definition for um, the acts that are in fact covered, but says that whenever you do anything that under the laws of your or under your local copyright law is an act that is relevant under copyright law, um, you need to um, to accept these license terms. That's what it basi basically says, and, and and thereby makes reference to um, to the local concepts and tries to harmonize or to to bring all those cons concepts under under one common. Um, umbrella concept, and um, I mean this shows that there are s there there certainly are differences in the um, um, in in in, in, in um, for example the concept uh, concept of um, der derivative works. So um, I, I hope that um, helps you at all. I mean it's not very sp I, 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 I don't know the specific differences between French and and, and U.S. copyright law. Is there some guideline in terms of knowing um, if if the provider of the software is in a certain is in one country and the user is in another? What the sort of guideline for which law would apply? Um, well yeah, I mean, first of all, that would depend on on the license um, contract, obviously, and um, uh, in case there is no license contract, um, or or in case um, there, there, there might be an implicit license contract which does not contain a choice of law, um, then there are certain international rules that apply and that would decide on the statute that applies. And uh, for example, in um, 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 that would typically depend on, I mean, whether it's a, a single license contract, whether there are services around and um, a general um, rule is that the law applies of um, that party that provides the um, characteristic um, performance or gives the characteristic um, um, assets under the contract. So, um, but I mean, you hardly ever find a license agreement that does not contain a choice of law uh, clause. I'd appreciate a discussion of the nature, the virality of derived work. To take a particular example, let's suppose that I pick up some software which I think is clean. I incorporate some bits of this software into, let's say, a Syncom production. A year later, I suddenly discover, oops, this software is not clean, so I rip out those specific methods and classes. But of course, for a year, I've been studying that software and I've learned a great deal from it. Um, can I assume that the mental pollution is irrelevant? Or on the contrary, is my mind now polluted with this derivative work such that the replacement I write is obviously, given that I'm probably doing this in great hurry, it might naturally be very closely influenced by the thing I'm replacing. Um, uh, I, got, I heard what was said about you'll only know when you're in front of the judge, so I'm wondering, is it really the case that when you're finally in front of the judge, he says, all right, you know, sticking new class acronyms on the front of all your classes was not adequate, as against something else. So uh, I, I, I throw it open to the panel. Just how mentally polluted can one, can one get, and I how can one free oneself I from I'd it? like to point out, that, Neil, that you would have, of course, um, checked with your product manager and our legal team before you included any open source in our product, so you wouldn't have made that mistake. Um, but apart from that, to take the hypothetical company, Henrietta. <laughs> well, hypothetically, um, uh, there, there could be different aspects. From, from a legal perspective, there could be different aspects to such a scenario. First of all, from a mere copyright perspective, um, creating a or, or writing a new code is not copying a previously existent code and therefore would not um, provided that, obviously provided that you do not um, copy parts but really rewrite the entire thing, that would not be um, a copyright an, an, an issue under copyright law. But um, that does not um, hinder patent claims. That would more be an issue for um, a patent infringement scenario because while copyright, pr copyright protection um, uh, um, or, or, or um, 
co why copyright protects the um, specific work and the implementation of, 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 of and, and the way something is written, um, patent, a patent protects the idea that is behind. And if you sort of apply that ide idea, that can be a question in a patent law. And then maybe just one, one, one uh, more as aspect, there, there can also be um, an aspect um, under trade secrets law to that where um, you, um, in, in your relation to your um, employer um, or your, um, your contract uh, your, or your, your, um, um, the party who pays you as a freelancer um, can be obliged to, to can you, you can be obliged to, um, um, uh, can be an, under a, a confidentiality obligation that can be a question of statutory trade secrets protection and so, so, so from that angle um, uh, you might get into trouble as well. Okay, that, so that certainly helps me. Can I just actually explain the scenario I'm more thinking uh, of? Can I, can I just interject? Can we ask the other panel panelists, does this mental pollution keep you awake at night? So, Bert, <laughs> are, you, are you not sleeping or, or uh, do you want to comment on that? And I'll go down I'm the panel. I'm sleeping very well, thanks. Um, Good. Um, so so my, my take on this is... Um, by now, I know much more about licenses than I ever wanted to know. Um, like, you know, uh, that squeak is... Um, uh, that's not about this panel, it's about the last 10 years um, uh, in, in the squeak community. Um, and the thing to keep in mind is that any um, amount of reading licenses and doing due diligence and whatever you do, it's not keeping you from getting sued. Nothing can prevent that. So if, if someone is set on that, they, everyone can sue you over an anything. That's, that's just how it is. It's all about risk, right? Um, I hope you will follow up on that. Um, it, y you just balance the risk. And um, if someone uh, does that stuff on his own, there's little risk of getting sued. Uh, the larger the communities get or the company gets, the, the more risk there is. Um, and so you have to evaluate how much effort do I have to put in um, to minimize the risk um, and how much uh, can I say just, okay, I take that risk and I'll, I'll even um, do it when it comes up. So um, we do that sometimes. Marcus, you, uh, I don't see any gray hairs yet, but what about you? So, yeah. So um, my involvement with licensing was actually in with Squeak because I started to uh, build uh, Debian packages of Squeak a long time ago, and the result was that at that point um, actually people started to read the license for real. Is it a bit? Yeah. Which which was actually quite interesting because it was intended to be an open source license only that the lawyer who wrote it did not know about what open source is because it was in 1996. And so th that was, was a very, a very uh, strange thing because we then had to actually understand this license and try to argue for a long time or try to find uh, that it's good enough or not and try to change things. And in the end, at some point, I think it was clear that this could not be solved by just uh, contribution by 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 open source contributors. So the the what what that so the realizing that was then done was a really big uh, big piece of work that was done by Viewpoints Research. And um, what I learned from that is that you need to really at the beginning decide uh, what kind of license to to use, and then to to um, have some rules of how you make sure that this license is actually the license of all the code. And if you do that up to the point where it makes sense, so you should not spend all your time with that, then it, it will be okay. So it's kind of the same ideas. You, sh you should think about it at the beginning, you should make some rules and then uh, you should program again and not spend uh, your nights thinking about licenses. But you need to really think at the beginning. Jason, are you smug? About what? Uh, presumably you don't have to stay awake at night with licensing. 
Uh, Syncom probably, I, I guess, doesn't have an open source licensing on their small talk, or? Well, we, we certainly have things that we have put into open source, and we have uh, thought fairly carefully about the uh, open source licenses that we use. I think that we also uh, probably think very carefully about the uh, open source products that we use and the licenses that they come with. And so we care very much that uh, an open source product that we might choose to depend upon um, has uh, good and clean licensing and uh, clearly attributable ownership. And, and, and I think that you know, most commercial entities would probably be the same. So I'll, if, it's, if it's okay with the panel, I'll move on. But I know that Steph had the first part of his question not answered, so he wants to come back. So here. No, no, but seriously, so this means that you work from a U.S. company. Can you sign a uh, MIT license to contribute to Squeak or Faro on the MIT is me? No, I, I ask uh, her. <laughs> on her. Um, um, Anna, you, you, um, uh, um, your, your question is whether a, a um, person that is employed with a U.S. company, right, can um, uh, is able to uh, create, or or, or uh, whether the, um, the person does own stuff that it cr um, develops, particularly in, in 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 the spare time. Is that right? Remember that from your first uh, question. I mean, that does depend on. Um, I know that there are pretty strict regulations or, or statutory um, provisions on that in the, in the U.S., but that depends from, from state law, obviously, as well, in the U.S., where, where um, those federal states have their um, employment laws. And I, I, I'm not an expert on U.S. employment laws. I know that, um, that the tendency is strict there, but I do not know to which extent that reaches into the spare time. I'm sure that there are sort of carve-outs, but um, I don't know where they start. So, so my question, this is then... What is the what is the trust that we can put in that license in that case? Because if you tell me that this is based on the state in the U.S., what is the situation in Germany? We should check in France. We should check mm. their, their country. So, in fact, at the end, this is just yeah. that's For that I mean aware. You know, we have said, oh, MIT, but in fact, this is not. So, because I don't have the right, in fact, to to put it. No, I mean it's the part that keeps me awake at night. I mean, it's actually within the responsibility of every contributor to check um, uh, what conditions he is under and what, what the employment contract says. And um, I mean, for example, in Germany, um, while um, um, uh, obviously the content of the employment contract um, has priority um, and, and or, or um, governs um, the rights to your developments, um, there are certainly certain boundaries to um, to the um, extent to which the um, employer can say everything that you create is my own uh, and belongs to 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 the company, and um, typically the differentiation um, um, in relation to the spare time is whether what you do in your spare time does relate to what you do on the, in your job. Um, I mean. There are a lot of scenarios where it's difficult to really differentiate between spare time and work time, where pr people work from home, and um, the mere fact um, uh, whether you are in the comp company or not can certainly not be the decisive criterion. And therefore, the, the um, differentiation is typically made between um, whether what you're doing does belong to what you're doing at work or whether it doesn't. And if it doesn't, um, you are typically free to do to, to, to do open source what you're creating. Just a quick process check with everyone. Obviously, we are going over here, and we do want to show us your projects. But I think this is very important stuff. So, if everyone would agree, can we go? Out, can we give half an hour more to the panel, and then can we then continue on with show us your projects? I know that kind of extends into the evening, but is everyone okay with that? Yeah. Okay. So. We will continue with the questions. And please try and direct them to everyone in, in the panel as well so we can kind of get differences of, of viewpoints. I'd like to talk about um, changes in licenses. Uh, let's, uh, I'm here. <laughs> let's say I'm, I'm downloading some, or I'm, I'm a user or even a vendor, including an open source project in my product. Um, and I use it, and I downloaded it when it was GPL. Um, and the developer, somewhere in time, decides to switch to MIT, 
either for his new version or just generally? What do I have to think about in that moment? We've talked a lot about selecting the right software or the right licenses, but what if I do if I've done my selection um, and the developer changes the license? Is it attached to the version that I downloaded or how do you handle change in licenses? Um, yes, the, the license applies to the thing you downloaded. And so if you if you downloaded it as GPL, you can the GPL gives you the right to use it perpetually under that license. Um, it might be that there m may not be any more versions under that license, so you might be prevented from using the new stuff, but you can keep that version as it is. So um, I have to say something about the GPL, though. Um, to my knowledge, GPL is fundamentally incompatible with Smalltalk code. Um, I, I'm not really the expert on that, but um, because in, in the, the GPL explicitly mentions linking and um, executables and binaries, and uh, those concepts just do, do not map to Smalltalk very well. And so you're really poorly advised uh, if anyone offers o a GPL software to Smalltalk or in Smalltalk. I don't think that's a, a good way to to do it here. I mean, that's kind of similar to what Monty says. You know, you can't if if the license says you have to um, y you have to duplicate the copyright statement and you don't have one. Well, that's not really you know that license doesn't make sense. And so similarly. Um, you know, I'm not an expert on the GPL either, but if the GPL is referring to terms that just simply don't make sense for the thing you're distributing, then you have to say, well, is that really the right license to be distributing it under? So um, I sort of feel the same way about that. What's that? The rest of the license agreement is still in, in effect, even if some parts of it are not. I think that that also depends a bit on the jurisdiction, doesn't it? I mean, in, in, in case, or as a general rule, and as you said, if you receive a piece of code under the GPL, that piece of code is governed, I mean, provided that it's true that it has been licensed under the GPL, obviously that piece of code is governed by the GPL. And then um, um, as a starting point, it would not, I mean, whether the GPL applies or not would not depend on whether it fits or whether it's a suitable license um, for, um, the type of code or whether it covers all purposes and, and, and uh, modification scenarios. Um, but th that matter of um, compatibility, that um, actually comes up when you start combining or when you start um, um, developing things in a, I mean, if, if, it's, if, it's, if it were small talk, um, uh, if you start uh, developing um, um, applications in that environment, and then those would obviously be be, be um, automatically licensed under the GPL as well. And that's, I mean, I guess that uh, when you refer to incompatibility, that would be between the GPL and the MIT um, license, or from or from the type of software as such. Um, probably compatibility. Compatibility <laughs> wasn't the, the right word I, I chose there. Um, there. There is no incompatibility between the GPL and MIT because MIT essentially is, incom is compatible with anything. Yeah. It's so simple, it just says, don't sue me, do whatever you like, um, which, and it's only two paragraphs, so that's why we like it. Lawyers don't, in general, so big companies don't tend to do their stuff under MIT, but rather Apache, which is a liberal license too, so they're pretty much equivalent uh, but one is much harder to understand than the other, and there's also some mm. patent stuff in there. Um, like for the layman, like for me. Um, mm. So uh, that's the reason we chose to, um, to ask our contributors in the Squeak community to relicense their contributions to MIT, um, even though the Squeak kernel was relicensed by Apple to the Apache license. And so we have this combined licensing now that the contributions after 1996 are MIT and the, the original core is still under the Apple, uh, no, under the Apache 2.0 license from Monty 2.0. Um, so that's the result we got. Uh, I, I have a comment on the, on the GPL. Um, 
I have not read the GPL version 3, but as of version 2, it does not mention linking, it does not mention any of these terms, it mentions derivative work. And the derivative work is left up to the definition. Now it is the statement made by the Free Software Foundation that they believe that that covers linking, but that language is not in the, I agree that, that because there's a lot of doubt about what this really means, because it hasn't been tested in the court, that it's a very bad idea to use it with small talk, where simply loading something into the image might be construed as linking, and it is the stated intent of the creators of the license that that be covered, even though it's not stated in the license. It puts a lot of doubt in the situation. Avoiding it's probably a good idea, but th the wording's not there as far as I know. It's pretty much what I wanted to say, but couldn't really um, make explicit. Thanks. Yes, uh, question to the legal expert. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> or to Syncom. Well, we have a license with Syncom, but what happens if we use Seaside in our product? Do we have a license agreement with Syncom or with the open source? Um, in regard to what happens when, what, what are you envisaging? Well, if we use the Seaside framework in our in our product and okay we provide uh, we provide it as uh, a part of our product and it is supported so um, <coughs> you can use it. it it's covered under um, the license that it's provided with and um, but that do I have to check then the open source license or do I just have one license with, with you guys I I might have to consult my lawyer here. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the situation that you would find yourself in is that uh, we have provided it uh, with warranties and support, and you could rely on that to effectively provide a wrapper. We are taking some level of responsibility. I believe that is how you could look at it. We are distributing it, and we definitely could pick up obligations because of that. My lawyer might now just hit me around the head, of course. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I must say, I don't know how Seaside would um, um, sort of um, uh, interplay or, or, or fit into that, so. I, I think the other thing is to say whether it is provided as an additional component or whether, it, you know, something that is provided on the CD and that we don't support or, whether it's something integral yeah. to our product, but and that also has some difference. But you put it on your product line, you say, uh, well... No, no, I, I, I don't, I'm not stepping away from the statement I made earlier. I'm, I'm just uh, highlighting that if we, uh, if a hypothetical vendor decided to uh, provide on a CD something that was clearly licensed, uh, an, uh, an open source product that was clearly provided under an open source license, then that open source license would apply. But my question is, in fact, do I need to take the hassle of looking uh, into all the licenses when I buy a license with Syncom and see, well... Uh, Twitter decides to sue all the C-sides. Does someone cover them? Uh, that's not a question for me, I don't think. I think that's a question for Julian. <laughs> 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 that sounds like a question for the lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> it's, fu it's funny how legal conversations go, isn't it? D didn't in the talk I say just avoid these issues? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I don't... I, I, thought, I thought we got away with it. Right? Yeah, I thought so too. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah sorry, next question. No, but it's going to be related. <laughs> I ju just want to add on that in a question to Henrietta, maybe, um, if I remember right, both for Glob and for Seaside, um, the distribution includes the license text that come with the open source development. So um, does it mean, and this I think was a question, does it mean if you have a Syncom contract about the base product and it adds open source products that come with the additional license that Syncom is simply passing on to you, that these licenses become, if you use the add-on, part of, of the license that you're working on. Oh, I is can that answer that one. So yeah, basically, it depends on the individual license between us and our customer. 
That's my question. Yeah, it, d it depends on the individual license, and that would be a case-by-case -case basis, and we don't discuss individual licensing situations. Uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, I want to ask uh, two questions. Uh, Uh, well, it's a uh, one question with two parts. So <laughs> 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 Well, uh, okay, personally, I like uh, the GPL that uh, I have uh, published in GPL in other environments and uh, li uh, in other envi environments and languages, and uh, I also respect uh, the MIT. And, uh, Is that a question? Ye uh, yes, uh, it is a question. Uh, but to my understanding, GPL uh, is the more popular uh, license in the free software and open source uh, community. And uh, maybe, maybe the most uh, legally advanced <coughs> to protect uh, communities. In that sense, I think that uh, we should uh, ask questions about MIT and GPL uh, compatibility and uh, if uh, there are issues, and I, I understand there are uh, with uh, licensing small talk under uh, uh, GPL, we should also ask about uh, dual licensing. So this, that's, these are my two parts of the question. Mm -hmm. I dual didn't hear a question there. What is, what is, are you asking them why they're not using GPL? Uh, well, they can answer that if, uh, <laughs> if they want, but, but uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm asking about dual licensing because MIT uh, is compatible with uh, GPL in the terms of, uh, of the license. And uh, if, uh, as a community, we should discuss uh, with uh, the Free Software Foundation to have clauses in the GPL uh, that uh, could support uh, small talk. Okay, so we're asking that question. Should we ask the Software Foundation about uh, GPL and small talk? Can yes, well, okay, so I've made my point, let's I think. <laughs> so, um, the, the problem is that, um, or I personally think that the GPL is far more complex than a MIT. So I, I like simplicity, especially after what we have seen in the past. So I guess that especially the squeak community, including uh, the offsprings, are really tired of any licensing discussions. And so simplicity wins. And I don't think that anyone is in any way interested in discussing about licenses again. And so you will not find anyone who has the energy to do that. And, that, and the other thing is that um, I actually like the MIT license even for practical reasons other than simplicity, because it allows you to, do, uh, to use uh, the system in products without having uh, to think about how you violate the GPL or not. Mm -hmm. And that simplifies actually uh, a lot building products on top of the open source software. And I think that the GPL does not actually help too much because imagine someone uses GPL software by breaking it. Do you really want to include the uh, contributions of these people that are not interested in working with you? I, I don't think that this makes sense in, in any way to, to uh, have these contributions by force and who will look at them if the original author is not interested in contributing. And contributing itself is so much it's, it's so much more interesting for the people to contribute because it's good than to be forced by a license that I don't think that you actually need the viral uh, properties of the GPL for a community. So that's my, my personal opinion. Uh, well, I was just gonna say, I mean, I don't think to me the, the GPL, the point of the, G the virality of the GPL is not to uh, ensure that you get the contributions back from someone who's, who's using it, but that if a commercial entity decides to use it to make money that you can say, well, you know, we, need, we want the license fees out of it. Um, it's the kind of, you use it for free and contribute back. Um, it, it's, the, it's the sort of prevention, it's the, it's the, threat, of, um, the threat of license fees as a, as a preventative act to me. I think uh, we could take the, the pros and cons of GPL offline. Um, so it's, uh, but, but you brought up a, a good point about dual licensing. Um, and only the copyright holder can relicense his work. So what we would have to do, hypothet hypothetically speaking, uh, is to uh, go to every contributor who ever contributed to, to Squeak again um, and ask them, okay, 
would you do that uh, again under GPL? The first contributor we would have to go to would be Apple Incorporated. Good luck with that. Um, and then it's taken us years, literally, to collect the, the statements from, I think, about 500 contributors. Uh, so I can say with certainty it's not going to happen. I think one other final point to make on uh, MIT is that it is a more attractive license for commercial companies wanting to reuse um, uh, open source products, and that is one of the reasons that it is currently a more popular licensing option, uh, because if you want your open source product to be used by commercial companies, then that is a license they are more likely to agree with. Yeah, thank you. I, I have a question about the uh, warranty obligations you mentioned at the end of the talk. I find it kind of surprising because presumably there's a warranty obligation in every single country around the world, uh, in every country different. I mean, now when you upload your project somewhere on the website, it's obvi obviously accessible in the entire world. So I don't see how that can reasonably be expected for you to comply with whatever warranty obligations there are implied by laws all, all around the world. Whoever said the law had to be reasonable. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it's a serious point. You, you, you've, you've looked at this problem from the point of view of that sounds insane, you know, because the obligations that I would be assuming are by publishing an open source uh, component uh, to the web would potentially um, put me in a life of servitude, you know. Um, I, I think the truth is that if you approach this problem uh, with a bit of prior thought, you can do some things that will mitigate your uh, risks and obligations. And, um, you know, it's just if you haven't thought about that and you've just sort of thrown yourself in without thinking about the, the obligations and the issues there, you ru do run into problems. But, I mean, you mentioned that uh, under some jurisdictions you cannot really... Uh, absolve yourself of the obligations in a, in a yeah. Yeah. I mean those um, statutory warranty obligations come into play where you distribute the software um, and um, what m maybe as a very first step they this issue derives from a certain conflict between a um, if you have a commercial distribution scenario a um, the sales transaction that you have on the one hand side, um, which would be considered as a sales transaction where, where wherever there is a um, um, some sort of rem remuneration for that that you get that f that you get for the distribution, and that could also be, for example, a combination of your um, your software distribution and a service offering that you offer, which is a certainly a, a um, freak or common scenario um, with open source software. And um, in, in, in such scenarios, you have a certain warranty concept under statutory law that applies to that distribution um, bit of your transaction. And then you have the open source license that tries to exclude all warranties. And um, you can, um, um, and that depends on the particularities of the local laws, but you can only exclude your warranties to a certain extent. And you have this conflict. And um, this conflict is certainly unlikely to, um, to um, turn against you where you only um, give something into a project um, on a private basis. But it, is, it can't, does come into play wherever um, a project is commercialized and, the, um, and, 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 and somebody distributes a um, distribution and um, uh, therefore has a um, purchase transaction contract between himself and the licensee and on the other hand has those open source conditions which um, do not apply directly bet between him, in addition do not apply directly between, between him and the licensee but between the original uh, licensor and the licensee. And you somehow have to co cope with that conflict. And um, in, in, in commercial contracts, you, do, you typically do not get around accepting a certain extent of warranty, um, uh, however large that extent might be under, under the local um, jurisdictions. So. Yes. Um, 
I have to admit that I'm terribly confused. So I want to do some open, s open source software, but I'm using a commercial product. So ob obviously this must be some derivative work because I'm... Uh, no. Uh, it's not? Oh. You can use the GNU compiler, for example, to build any product. So and that's not a derivative work. License it. Squeak is compiled whatever. with GCC. Okay. That's true. So. No, no, I'm using Syncom Smalltalk. So um, I, I use that, and of course, I make use of uh, stuff I find there, and probably some additions, extensions, or something relating to this product, I intend to open source. So how is that playing together? So what are you asking? You're asking if, you're, if, you've built, uh, if you want to build an open source product using a um, proprietary commercial tool chain. How does that affect? It depends. I mean, that's, um, that's one of the main difficulties that um, um, Jason and Julian intended to um, address here, that um, before open sourcing anything, you certainly need to make sure that um, uh, what, you try, what, what you're planning to open source is free of proprietary um, uh, rights. You need Suppose to it is. Suppose it's just yeah. has his, his brain work. Is he yeah. then safe to use it? I mean, I, ha I, mean I have the answer for you, which is just contribute to Squeak. <laughs> I, I, I think the answer is I, I don't know the answer to that. And I don't, don't know if there is a uh, wider answer in, uh, you know, globally. But I'm sure somewhere someone has come up with that issue. Whether it's been proved in court, I don't know. Hello. Um, I uh, find a different uh, thing on the web of the licensing situation of Glorp. It's on SourceForge with an LGPL license. I s found something about a, a change uh, LGPL license, and there's it's also in a Squeak Source uh, uh, place where it's under MIT. That seems like an interesting situation. Um, do you want to answer that, Alan? Because you yeah. probably are more able to answer it than I am. Okay, we're just bringing Alan on the, on the panel here for 30 seconds. And since I'm being given the microphone, I'll just comment that on Christian's question, I'm not sure that it's any different in small talk than if I were writing an open source framework that you know, depended on Microsoft libraries or, or anything else. It's an interesting question, but I don't think it's unique to us. I agree completely. Um, with respect to the GLORP license, the GLORP license currently is under LGPL. I am in the process of initiating a change to a more flexible license. I was thinking MIT, but I'm open to suggestions. Um, so if it's in squeak source and it says MIT, that's not right. It might be right shortly, but at the moment it's not right. I, actually, I should make one correction. It is under LGPL where I also wrote some additional text because the LGPL, at least in that version, had some terms like linking and executable. And I wrote some explanation of how I interpreted those terms as applying to Smalltalk. It, it was a n neat piece of uh, inter interpretation, actually. I think it it's makes it pretty clear. Uh, maybe a comment to Squeak Source. So in Squeak Source, there, there you can choose the license, and it seemed to be a good idea in the beginning, but the problem is that some people uh, forget it or choose the wrong one, or if they actually look at projects, they uh, do not uh, check uh, the setting, even so the author thinks that people would. So it's a bit uh, a question if it was a, such a good idea to add that to Squeak Source, to, to have this uh, in, in the project settings, the license stuff, and not uh, that, that the people that do the software make clear clear in the documentation and wherever what the license is. 
there, I can't remember, is there a default right now or do you have to like, is it blank by default and you have to choose one or is it? It's blank by default, I think. Um, but that, that brings up a, a good thing and um, someone else mentioned it. Uh, maybe we can reach some kind of um, convention how we apply or how we include the license with a package. Um, so that if, if we had that, for example, for Monticello packages, then you wouldn't have to choose in the uh, squeak source UI what the license is, but you could just extract it from all the packages that are there, and maybe they are even differently licensed, and you would just say, okay, there are packages here that are MIT and um, whatever else. And also, this here's a package that does not have the license info. Where's Colin? Uh, I think Bert just answered my question. It was a follow-up to Norm, um, who said it's really important to include the MIT um, preamble in your if you intend to license under MIT. And I was just going to say, how do you do that in Smalltalk when we don't have a concept of files, really? So I've seen class comments used for that. So in each class, you have to include the MIT preamble. It seems a bit excessive. No, I don't think so. Oh, go for every method. Come I on. Mean, you know, you, you could simply have a, you know, a class called GR license or whatever and put it in there, I guess. I, I mean, I think it, if you include it in some way that's fairly um, obvious. Yeah? <laughs> 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 I mean, Getting a, a puzzled look from over here. Okay, just, we don't know. We, haven't we don't know. I'm, I'm just yeah. making it up. <laughs> does, does Norm have a comment on that? Because for something so fundamental, it seems we've bit, we're a little bit vague. Well, Norm, because he's been through the, the problem Monty. with MIT. Monty, Monty sorry, Monty. Oh, no. Yeah, I mean, it is kind of tough. It's just that the MIT license says you need to reproduce this text and this, and with the assigned name of who the copyright person is so we can contact you. So it's, it is important to do that. I don't, I don't know how you, uh, you know, yes, in a system that has files, uh, what you know, what we do is we put one copy up at the top. I mean, we don't put it. You don't have to put it in every file. You just have to explain that it covers this project. Well, top of what? Uh, well, I mean, in files we put it in something in the top level yeah, directory. If you have files. Okay, fi files are fine. But what about an image? The top yeah. of the image? No, I mean. <laughs> so I was. I said in the situation of files, what I would do in you know in the image, it depends. Are you are you talking about the entire image? Obviously, in a CINCOM image, that's not going to work because you're really talking about a particular class or a particular... So usually uh, these uh, licenses apply to source code. Uh, so what we in Squeak do is in the beginning of the sources file there's the license. There's just a chunk uh, in there. Um, and I'm not sure if in the changes file there's a license. Probably not. Um, what, what would seem to make sense would be to put it in an, M in an MCZ file. It could cover everything that was in, you know, in your MCZ file. I don't know how you define the boundaries. Um, yeah. Okay, I think it's a solution that someone's going to work on at some point. Okay, I'm hoping that the answer to this question can be good news and cheer us all up again. Um, going back to my scenario of way back when, I guess the scenario I'm really thinking of is going to a conference, someone stands up, they present something that they say is a really cool pattern for solving some problem. You think that's a wonderful idea, so you go home and you use that pattern in your code. If I have understood everything I've been told, they own the copyright to that pattern, but when you take their text and their, their code and put it into your system, necessarily rewriting it, you have nothing to worry about. Now, is that a, is that a fair okay. conclusion? Just a bit of clarity here. You're talking about some uh, abstract concept that they're discussing rather than a uh, detailed sort of chunk of code that no, they've I'm talking distributed. About, I'm talking about people you know, Kent Beck publishes software best practice patterns. There's the uh, Martin Fowler book, which shows you how okay. to book, solve a lot of problems in finances. And they have, yeah, but he goes to a conference. Let's suppose it's not a book, it's a conference, or he sits down and he shows it to you. This is a wonderful pattern. You think that's a great idea. 
what he's shown you has included some lines of code. Your system is not his system. You inevitably rewrite what he's done, but you, he's shown you a pattern and you said, hey, what a great idea, thanks, thanks for telling me that. I'll use that pattern. Now, design patterns are important to us. It seems to me, even though it's at a conference, I seem to be hearing the copyright remains with the person. He went no, to the but conference but to tell people the pattern. But, but you need, to, you need to take care that copyright is for text and not for ideas. And a pattern is an idea. So a pattern you can patent, but you cannot get a copyright for it. But if you put it in a book, the book will be copyrighted. And, uh, and, and the book has actually uh, somewhere in the back or mostly in the front a description of how you can use the source code that is printed. And mostly it says it's okay to yeah. use. But in many conferences, it might well be that there is no, there isn't a particular copyright thing. It was just presented at a conference. The intent is clearly to use, but hey, I can't remember what the so statement. Okay, of that if you put are you really expecting Ken to sue you? No. <laughs> yeah, what have you done to piss him off? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I'm thinking this actually happens. I was going to say, what if Oracle buys Ken? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oracle buys Ken. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then you start running. Yeah, yeah. But I'm just, I, was, I was hoping the answer is good news, as in, there's nothing to worry about. If Even you put it, though if you there was a piece of code there, and you looked at that piece of code, and maybe the first thing you did was type it in before you started rewriting it. If you ask me, I process. will answer, don't worry about it. Yeah, I but agree. I would never I, have worried I guess about Henrietta it. wouldn't be as plain. Well, <laughs> I'm hoping this can be good news. I'm hoping there's at least something we don't have to worry about. Yeah. Well, well, I must confess that my, my picture of what that pattern, as you, as you name it, would look like lo look like uh, is somewhat limited. But, um, um, well, as Jason said, um, copyright would protect the way it was written or presented or what you saw on the, on the slide. And um, um, as long as you do not reproduce that, you're not, um, you, you're not um, um, in the field of copyright. But you might, um, and, and but that is as, as we said before, you might well be in the field or in line of a patent claim, which is not, um, and, and, and actually people, or, or um, at least commercial software um, manufacturers, um, do start patenting software, and um, even in countries where they haven't done so before and where it was more difficult before. And I mean, so far, those patents have, um, at least not in a broad context, um, have hardly been used aggressively against others, but they've been collected in order to, um, well, build um, defensive portfolios. and. Um, th so there are many, many, many software patterns out there of which nobody is uh, aware at all, but which um, at a certain point in the future could well be drawn or taken out of the drawer, drawer and, um, um, and, and used aggressively. Um, and so that is a real, I mean, and, and that is a reali realistic scenario as well in our um, perception because um, um, there are many, p many patents, and once people start using patents against others, um, the others will, will start using theirs as well. And um, so that does constitute a serious um, threat. And, and obviously nobody can see patents. And, um, and also, I mean, even if you start researching on patents in a field where you are active, you won't find patents that have only been recently filed or applied for because there are um, 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 periods during which those patents are not, or, or those applications are not published, and the length of the periods depend um, uh, on the jurisdiction. But um, during those periods, you won't, I mean, you have actually no chance to find out um, whether um, anybody's trying to patent what you are, um, or patent an, I an idea that is behind what you are currently developing. And, um, but you can, I mean, you can certainly get a feel for whether a certain company has, cu has patents in a certain field. Um, and and, and uh, we have seen a lot of clients very, very surprised um, uh, about the results of even a preliminary patent research where, um, where software companies are acting in a certain field and are um, developing applications for certain purposes and solutions and um, have never thought of patents before and then um, uh, sort of awake and, 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 and or wake up and, 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 and enter into a, um, well, not yet, but maybe to become a nightmare when they realize that um, companies, in particular in the US, have been patenting uh, ideas in those very fields for years and have been collecting patents. So that is, um, that is a serious issue. 
I would just like to say one last thing on that. That I if you want an example of what a pattern, uh, what patents look like, go and look at the uh, Google, the the patents that are being used against Google for a good example of what they are. And um, some of them are uh, incredibly simple uh, VM technology structures. Um, so it's, it's quite surprising what, what they're actually throwing at them. One, one last, last thing about patents. You need to be clear that patents even apply to things that you invent yourself. So even if you have never heard of anyone talking about something, but you invented it completely yourself, maybe even whole of computer science in addition, the patent applies. So if you start to worry about patents, you should stop programming. <laughs> so we've racked up quite a bill here with